Hey guys, and welcome to this 13th tutorial in the first steps and preparation series. Um, in this tutorial, we're going to take a look at ambient occlusion, environment lighting, and indirect lighting, and the gather method methods. And actually, let's just set up a environment texture real quick because we need it later. We need it later on for the environment lighting. And so let's just go to textures. Let's make sure um, world textures is selected. Let's add a new texture. Let's change it to an image, or image or movie. Let's under image go to open. And now let's just choose a angular map texture. Um, for example, this one. Okay, so let's change the mapping to uh, the mapping, this mapping here to Ang map. Let's check horizon and done we are. Now let's just check real sky and here we go. Okay, if you go to zero, F12, you can see we've got our background um, all set up and it actually um, displays according to um, the view your camera has. Okay, cool. Now, um, Let's just delete that. Let's add a mesh, uh, a plane, I mean. Let's also add a monkey, RX45. Let's just make sure it actually touches the plane with chin and back of, back of its head so it doesn't give us weird effects. Okay, now right now, if we zoom in and let's actually just rotate it so that we look at it from this side okay right now it looks like this okay we just have we have our lamp in this case a point lamp um, that cast light we got a harsh shadow and nothing else now um, in order to illustrate the first few settings let's just go to our lamp let's turn the energy all the way down to zero and let's go back to our world settings Let's make a quick render. We can see it's pitch black except for the background. Now that's not what we want. So let's do the next thing. Let's check ambient occlusion. And let's make sure it's set to add. And then let's just hit F12 again. And you can see your scene is lit. Now ambient occlusion um, kind of calculates how close two faces are, um, how close together two faces are. And dependent on that, they can shade each other or they cannot shade each other. Shade each other. Okay, it's kind of, yeah, something like that. I do not know the exact way it's calculated, but um, yeah, it then creates those darker areas and the lighter areas. And if you set it to add, it will actually lighten everything, and the dark areas are uh, less strongly lit than the bright areas. And if you set it to multiply, if you now with F12, you can see. That's what we get again. With multiply, it does not light your scene, but it darkens your scene. Okay, so instead of um, adding it onto um, the previous color, which would then, if you have like a white pixel from the ambient occlusion, it actually adds the white, which has a value of one, then it adds one onto the previous value. And therefore, you, you always get a higher value than before. Uh, while with multiply, if you multiply any pixel with another pixel that is one or lower it always darkens it okay that's, that's the difference between multiply and add and therefore with multiply um, if your scene is black because there is no kind of lamp and black has the value of zero so if you multiply zero with anything else you always get zero therefore it's always black so we need to set it to add um, yeah but as a rule of thumbs you're not supposed to yeah, just as a general rule, you're not supposed to use ambient occlusion to light your scene because that's what environment lighting is for, actually. Um, yeah, but for now, so we can actually see what you're doing. Let's set it to add. Now you can um, change this factor here. So if you set that to zero, it is once again black. If we set it to 0.5, you can see the lighting effect is weaker. And we can also force this above one because right now we can only change it from zero to one. But we can just type in 5 and hit enter and then you can see it looks like this way outblown um, but yeah I think I'm not even sure if this is limited at all I think you can pretty much type in anything you want yeah exactly 
Um, okay, so that's ambient occlusion for you. Um, important for ambient occlusion is also this lower part here. Um, so more on that in a second after we covered environment lighting. Now let's just disable ambient occlusion. Let's um, enable environment lighting. And now if we have 12, you can see it looks pretty much the same as ambient occlusion. Now, as far as I know, um, ambient occlusion, as I said, calculates the um, kind of rays from one face to another and kind of it looks how close are they and can they occlude each other. While environment lighting actually um, generates a um, virtual sky or just a virtual thing around everything and then it just uh, looks um, what rays can actually reach what areas, something like that. So it's it's a different algorithm as far as I know, but um, it gives you a very similar result um, the way it is set up right now. However, with environment lighting, you cannot um, occlude your scene, you cannot darken it. And you, ha you have this energy value here from zero, which gives you a black result because there's no energy, to one, which is what we had just now. And then you can also change um, the color of your environment lighting, okay? So that's something completely new. Now, if you check sky color, it will actually take the color of your sky. So um, let's set the horizon to red, completely red. And then you can see, um, because environment lighting actually uses the color of your horizon, which is not the color that's actually displayed, that's actually rendered as your horizon, just the color that you've chosen here, then it appears completely red. And now let me just try something. Let's go to blend sky and let's set this to something very, very bright, like something green. And now if we have 12, I'm not sure if... Yeah, you can see it actually considers um, both colors, okay? So if we go to something, something less extreme like this, you can see now you have a red and a green lighting. Um, the red coming from... Um, yeah, the green being the senate color, so it comes from above and from below, and the red being like the um, middle color. Okay, so this is not what you want, but you can see it gives a quite nice result, in my opinion. Yeah. But since we've actually already set up that texture, let's just put that black to... Uh, let's just leave it like this, let's just uncheck blend. Since we've already set up this nice texture, we could as well use that to light it, right? So let's just change this from sky color to sky texture. Now you can see, that's what you get. And um, right now, this is a bit too dark in comparison to, to the scene, actually. Um, but what you can see is that you kind of have a lighter area over here, which is why, because of this part over here, which lights it um, in a different color than the rest of the scene. So it kind of, yeah, it's got a really cool result. But let's just increase, increase the environment lighting effect to, let's say, 2. So that's not too strong. And you can see that's more like it. Actually, let's even put it to three. Oh, here we go. Once again to three. And you can see it starts to look pretty darn good. Um, as you can see, it's this uh, same issue as with ambient occlusion, it's way too noisy, way too grainy right now, but that's because of the samples down here, so... Um, yeah, and one other thing to note is, and that is actually also something that would be easier to explain if we had covered the compositor already, however, um, we will do that quite soon because I'm quite eager to do that actually, I love the compositor, but then it would be easier to explain something here. Right now, I have environment lighting checked. Now if I also check ambient occlusion and set it to add, you can guess what happens. It becomes even brighter, okay? So now the scene is lit by environment lighting as well as by ambient occlusion, which is not what you want, okay? But sometimes you'd like to have environment lighting, like lighting your scene, and ambient occlusion, um, occlusion uh, occluding certain areas. Now, if you set this to multiply, you could guess that this actually lights your scene and this one darkens it. But if you look at it, in the end, you can see the ambient occlusion has no kind of effect at all. Whether you turn that on or off, it makes no kind of difference. And I can only guess to as to why that is, but I believe it's because 
um, your scene gets rendered, right? And right now in your scene, there's no kind of light source. Well, there is one, but we you set that to zero, okay? So it doesn't really affect anything. Therefore, your render appears pitch black, okay? And then those two settings are actually kind of like multiplied onto um, everything, okay? So first it actually, um, or actually the ambient occlusion this way is multiplied because it says multiply here, not add. And then the environment lighting is added. And because of that um, order, it doesn't work because amb uh, if you have the ambient occlusion pass with multiply, then it multiplies it on over something black, which means it becomes just as black as it was before, there's no kind of difference. And only then it actually adds the environment lighting, okay? If it, if it would do that the other way around, it should, in my opinion, work. However, it just doesn't, because now if, if we put this lamp to over here, like this, we set that back to like one, like this, okay? And now if we, first of all, uncheck ambient occlusion, um, then we get this result. Okay, I'm just gonna um, break that operation. And now if I also check ambient occlusion, then you can see it actually is having an effect, okay? Just to make that a bit more clear, let's just push it all the way to five. You can see um, it's way too strong now, but you can definitely see the effect. But which, what you can also see, and that's quite interesting, only the area that's actually lit by that lamp um, actually receives this darkening effect. And that is once again because the rest of the scene is already black anyway. And yeah, if now we go to, into the compositor, we could change that to make it look right. But um, yeah, as for now, just, just remember that if you use environment lighting and ambient occlusion, um, it doesn't really work so well. Okay, that's kind of important. Um, okay, but it is kind of a cool effect, isn't it? Now, the next thing is, let me just see. Um, let's just check environment lighting again. Let's once again set the lamp value to zero. We don't really need it right now. And now let's just make sure that we play with those uh, gather methods. Okay, now right now we have it with ray trace. And we already know that quite well. Um, if we have 12 now, you can see the same result as before. And now if we, we have the sampling method here, which is constant QMC, and it takes us exactly 10 seconds and 34, 10.34 seconds. And you can see it's pretty grainy because we only have five samples, but that, that's okay. And now let's just change that to adaptive. Also five samples a threshold of 0 0.005 and so on. And now if I hit F12, you can see we get a similar result, but it's a bit more noisy than before, okay? And um, yeah, but it's much faster. You can see 7.58. Now if you increase the samples, let's say 10 right here, you can see that's what we get. It's still a bit noisy actually. Escape. And now if you go to constant with 10, then you can see, um, let me just, yeah, it's it's less noisy actually, but let me just pause the recording to see how long it takes. Okay, it took um, 36.9 seconds. Um, that's quite a lot of time. Um, but the result is a bit smoother. Um, yeah. Now there's also the constant chittered. And here you like this bias here. Um, the bias is only important if you have a smooth, a smoothed, um, um, object. So let's just real quick do that. Let's just change that to, um, let's select our monkey. Let's go to smooth. And now let's do one other thing. Um, as you might have noticed, it takes quite a lot of time to render this if we use environment lighting with a sky texture. So let's just put that back to white. Okay. Now let's uh, render this once again with adaptive QMC or actually with constant QMC. It's much faster now. Um, and let's uh, put the value back to one, of course. You can see that's what we get. And um, you can see it doesn't really work so well with the uh, smoothing. It kind of, you still have those sharp edges. Now, if we go to constant chittered, it, by the way, it took 3.95 seconds. So that's quite an improvement on time. If we go to constant chittered, you can see it takes 
less time and it gives you a comparable result. Um, yeah, and now if we, if we increase the bias to let's say 0.5, you can see um, it kind of reduces um, that issue with, uh, with, with the smoothing of with, with, with uh, the sharp edges, okay? Um, if we put it all the way back to zero, I can see it's, it's, it's there again, okay? So, yeah. Um, yeah, something to play around. Now, I, I never use constant chitter usually. I always use adaptive because right now you can see um, it takes less time. Well, not, not really less time, but it's, uh, yeah, it's just great. Uh, yeah, but this is just as always a few things to play around that gives you actually similar um, results and yeah, also similar render time. So it's not that big of a difference, but adaptive usually works just fine with the threshold of 0.1. I usually use it like this. Now to distance. Um, as I said before, ambient occlusion kind of calculates the distance between certain points of the object and then actually calculates whether, whether a certain part is occluded or not. Now with a distance, you can actually change the distance that uh, rays can travel before they are just ignored, okay? So if we change that to something higher, then nothing will happen, usually, because... Um, yeah, it's kind of obvious because there's not really anything around it, so if the rays travel even longer, and 10 is actually, I think, in Blender units, that would be already quite far. But if we set that to something really small, let's say 0 0.05, now if we have 12, you can see it looks very, very weird because um, now those faces only affect the face right next to it and only if the angle's sharp enough and so on. So usually with 10, it's quite okay. Um, also to compare the scene, it takes more time the longer the rays are apparently, but it's not that big of a difference. Um, and let's just change it to a very high number. Yeah, it, it's kind of weird. It, it even um, decreased the render time now. Um, yeah, anyway, let's just leave it this as 10 and that's okay. And the fall off is actually quite um, similar if we check that. That just um, defines the strength of the fall off. So if we have it with zero, then it's okay, the way it is right now. And if we go into plus, let's say 50, then you can see everything looks like this again. Because now also um, the rays have like a fall off effect. Um, the further away they are, the less effect they have, and therefore only... Yeah, you get a similar result to a low distance. Um, but yeah, it's got kind of a cool sh edge shading effect right now. Um, anyway, that's, that's probably because we used smooth on a... Let me just see, let's just go back to flat. No, it's still there. It's kind of it's kind of a funny effect, but not really what, you, what we want. And if we increase... Uh, if we set it to something negative, let's say minus 50, not really sure what that does. Then we get some really fun results. Okay, that was too extreme, probably. Never did that before. Let's go with minus 5 for now. Okay, I start to believe that um, it's you're not really supposed to set a negative value here. Uh, just everything becomes much darker. Let's set this to minus 0.1. See what that does. It just kind of increases the ambient occlusion effect, I believe. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, by quite a bit. But you can also see, um, yeah, it's kind of cool. But it also looks very grainy and, um, yeah, not something you usually use. But hey, if you want, you can actually do that. Uh, okay, let's just uncheck fall off. And then let's just take a look at the next thing. By the way, um, if you have it at adaptive, okay, you can also um, use adapt to speed. And that is if you use um, vector blur. And, um, and then when your object moves, um, fast moving pixels are actually being blurred, okay? And of course, um, the ambient occlusion quality on those fast moving pixels that are actually blurred afterwards doesn't have to be that high and therefore um, yeah it, it it gives you a sample reduction on those certain parts and therefore it can actually speed up your renders so uh, yeah if you ever use 
um, vector blur, which you probably will, then this is great. Okay, and then we also have approximate. And now if we hit F12, you can see suddenly all the graininess is gone. And that's because approximate doesn't uh, ray trace it, so, so no, no um, artifacts can appear. But on the other hand, it's also not quite as good because you can see you got those very dark over occluded areas. And then, yeah, it just doesn't really look right compared to the previous results. And you can actually decrease this um, this uh, this occlusion problem here by increasing the passes. So let's increase the passes to one for now. And you can see the problem is gone, but it's also not quite. Um, if we compare this to ray trace, you can see there is a difference, definitely. Um, Ray trace does look more accurate in a way, but I mean, if it, it is much faster, okay, approximate, even if you increase the passes to like one or two. Uh, let's just see, we had, let's check ray traced with adaptive. Now we have for 10 samples, we have 2.37 seconds. It's still quite grainy. So if, for a acceptable result, we'd have to go with, uh, I'd say 15 samples probably. Yeah, this starts to look quite okay. And now it takes 4.79 seconds. Now with approximate and one pass enabled, it takes us 1.65 seconds. And with two passes, which is supposed to be even better quality, although in this scene you cannot really see a big difference, it's 1.69. Now let's just um, do something here to um, compare the render times in a better way. Let's just go to this modifier panel. Let's add a subdivision surface, level 2. Increase that to 2. Well, or it doesn't really matter in the viewport, but the render has to be too. And then let's go to smooth. Okay, and right now, if we go back to our um, world properties, let's set it to ray trace again. Adaptive, 15 samples, as before, F12. Now, this will take more time for sure. And it takes exactly 5.75 seconds. If you go to approximate with one pass, or with, with uh, zero passes for now, then that's what we get, but you can see only 230, more than, or just about twice as fast. But you can see you get those over-occluded areas. Therefore, we're going with one pass for now. And that takes us three seconds, still much less. And if this is still too over-occluded, now in this scene, I think it works just fine, but in other scenes, this might, might still be a problem. We can also go to two passes. Um, it takes a bit more time, of course. But, yeah, and it's still faster, it's still faster. Now, um, this error here um, is supposed to give you more accurate results the lower it is. So let's put that to, let's say, 0 0.05 for now. And you can see, or actually you can't really see a difference in my opinion, at least not in this scene. If you have like a more complex scene, maybe you can. But you can see it takes much more time to render now. And it is probably even slower I believe it will be even slower than, yeah, it's much slow, 14 seconds, okay. So, 0.25 is usually quite all right. If you need to increase that, you will notice automatically. Now, what you can also do, you can use the pixel cache, okay. So if you check pixel cache, and then it's supposed to be faster because it kind of like interpolates pixels over neighboring pixels. I have no idea what this really um, does. But you can you can see the effect up here. You can see it's much much faster. But at the same time, we have like it can give you issues with um, over the edges. Okay, so right now to to de to demonstrate that, let's just. Um, set our, let's just delete our subsurf for now. And now if we have 12, you can see, um, actually right now it looks quite good, but sometimes you get like jagged edges, like as, uh, they look as if they weren't proper, properly anti-aliased. Uh, let's just say it to flat, maybe that changes something. Yeah, you can see, you can see those jags here, okay? Um, I'm not quite sure why that happens, but you can see now if we change this to, um, um, if we uncheck pixel cache, you can see that issue disappears. Okay, so pixel cache 
is when you have smoothed objects it is like perfect but sometimes with flat ones or also in other cases can give you a few problems and then one last thing is the correction so let's set the passes back down to zero um, let's hit f12 and you can see you get all those over occluded areas okay and now instead of increasing the pass we can also increase this correction here um, to let's say 0.5 you can set any value between 0 and 1 so let's go to 0.5 and after f12 you can see those over occluded areas disappear as well um, however it's like everything became looks like everything has now a, a lower contrast okay so um it doesn't isn't really a great solution but maybe you can, you can combine it let's go to zero here and let's set that to one you can still see a few overcluded areas maybe actually you can't really in this scene but maybe sometimes you can and then just increase the pixel cache to point two or something and uh, not the pixel cache i'm sorry the correction and then you can also get rid of those areas now if you set that all the way up to one it looks quite flat okay so that's kind of the disadvantage so yeah you have to combine those and play around with it until you get what you like okay and then also the fall off as always um again with those minus 0.3 look something like this i mean if that isn't cool what is i didn't really know that it would turn out like this but um yeah maybe if you when I go for an artistic effect, you can actually use this, but otherwise just go to, let's say, 10. Let's see what happens here. And you can see a similar result as before with fall off under ray traced. If it's not something you usually use, unless it is, like, I don't know, too dark or over occluded or something, you need to change it, okay? And also, maybe you need to change it when, um, yeah, w when you have, like, um, a wrongly sized character, okay, or, or, or an object. That is in reality much smaller, much bigger than you maybe need to adjust this fall off. Um, okay, so that's it for this for those options here. And the reason we skipped indirect lighting is because um, let's just uncheck environment lighting for now. Let's just indirect lighting. You can see with ray trace it says only works with approximate gather method. Okay, so this one doesn't work with ray trace. Therefore, it is quite handy to know how to use approximate. Because, as we saw just now, it is more difficult to set up proximate than it is to set up ray trace. Okay, so uh, indirect lighting. Um, first of all, let's just turn off the fall off, because otherwise we're going to get very weird results. And then let's just um, set up a, a different scene. Let's just take this lamp over there. And let's move it to somewhere around here. Then let's just add a plane. R, Y, 90 degrees. This is, so to say, our bounce bounce object. Uh, also, with um, control comma on your keyboard, you can make it so that this changes to median point. Now scale it up like this. And now uh, let's just reset our camera. To somewhere around there. And now let's just make a first render without indirect lighting. And you get this kind of... Okay, something's wrong here. Give me just a second. Oh, we need to change the energy to 1, of course. And now we get this standard result. Um, yeah, not very cool. And now if we check indirect lighting with one bounce, um, yeah, then we can see we get this result. And you can already see it's slightly illuminated over here, it's no longer pitch black, and um, also this side of the monkey, but let's say that's not enough. Let's increase that to 2, uh, wrong wrong field, to 2. And you can see it actually starts to look better and better. Let's say to, let's say, 5 bounces. Okay, you can also see it kind of starts to look unrealistic, but we don't, we won't worry about that just now. Now let's change the factor to, let's say, 5, which is really extreme. And then we get something like this. You can see light kind of bounces from everywhere to everywhere. You get those very overly lit areas. And yeah, the good thing is that even the darker areas are now lit. However, um, it's got quite a few issues here, but you can see what the effect does. You could also at the same time check ambient occlusion. Let's see if that works this time. Yeah, but um, it kind of cancels the indirect lighting effect. Um, yeah, so no ambient occlusion then. <clears throat> now in the compositor you could 
with the compositor you could probably make better use of that but um yeah more on that later now let's put that back to one which would be a reasonable number and um as you can see this this way you can make objects and yeah you can make kind of make them interact with each other in your scene so for example if you have like let's say a sphere here let's scale it down let's put it over there for example and let's give it a new material more in that in a later tutorial as i said but just for the sake of this tutorial let's make it completely red and now let's hit f12 and you can see um that was kind of a stupid idea to place it in front of the lamp so let's just place it below the lamp let's move down that in a little as well okay once again and you can see you get a very light orangish touch over here it's barely visible um, but we can just increase um, the factor here to let's say five again and now you can definitely see this reddish effect here and that looks quite realistic because yeah that's the way objects usually interact in a real scene like if you have like a complete red i don't know chair in front of a completely white wall then usually if you look closely you can see a slight slight reddish touch on the wall from the chair now one other thing you can achieve with indirect lighting is you can um, use mesh lighting okay so you can take that lamp not that lamp that sphere i mean you can change the color back to let's say white change the emit value to 2, which is for emission, delete the lamp. Now if we have 12, you can see our scene is now lit by this um, by this sphere. Uh, very cool. Of course, this is a very outblown, very, very strong effect right now, but you can also make that more decent by putting that to 1. And you can see it now lights our scene, but you can also see that it doesn't really cast any shadows and stuff. So yeah, that's that's important to note as well. Um, or actually, let's just put the bounce back to one. No, it doesn't cast any shadows. Um, cool. Now that is indirect lighting for you. Um, and as always, of course, here as well, if you check fall off with a strength of, strength of 10, for example, you can see the effect becomes way weaker because that also affects it and... Um, uh yeah that's more or less it guys for this tutorial i hope you've enjoyed it i hope you've learned something if you have any comments or questions or ideas or whatever um post in the comments below each video um thank you for watching and see you next time